Go ahead and be seated, please. We'll wait for Miss Hawthorne to return. He has. Sir, you were previously sworn and you do remain under oath. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Noting everyone's presence back in the courtroom, please have the jury return.
Funniest memory of my life, too. All right. Um, growing up, you remember where you first went to school? Uh, first memory I have of school, I think, is Elliott Elementary School, Westland, Michigan. Okay. Now, when, as you were, when you were very young, how was the relationship between your parents at that time? How do you remember it? At first? Yes. Um, not too bad. I mean, they were they were married, and there was you know there was there was a lot of love at first, and you know like any marriage I guess. But around seven, eight, nine years old, kind of started deteriorating pretty bad. When was your sister born? I was seven. Okay, about that time. Yeah. Okay. Shortly after. What were the first indicators? Now, I know you were very young. It's difficult, but try to get a grasp on that. Um, when did you have the first signs that your parents were having trouble? I mean, other than just all the arguing, they'd get into, they'd go from little fights to big fights. Stuff would get thrown, names would get called, somebody would go peeling out of the driveway in a vehicle. You know, it, it just escalated. I don't know exactly when it started, but... It just slowly got worse until finally they got they separated. And so what you said that started when you were about seven or eight, you said? Yeah, about seven, eight is when it when arguing started and then it just progressed. And you've got your sister Lauren. Right. right? And um how did she get along? I think because she was born like right in the midst of it, that she really just thought it was kinda normal. <laughs> she she just kinda adapted to it really. I, I didn't know. I didn't really know how to handle it, but she she did fine with it. I mean, she really never got drug in the middle of it too much. And where, when you were in school up in Michigan, your elementary school, do you remember that? Yeah. How'd you do in elementary school? I did did fairly well up until about third grade, um, which is also when I got put on Ritalin. Hey, who originally put you on Ritalin, if you remember? Well, my mom took me to a family physician. I don't know if I was ever actually diagnosed. Or, to my understanding, we just went in there and she told him, you know, a kid's hyper, put him on something. And when he just threw me on Ritalin, I don't know, I don't know what the highest doses was, but I know I was taking the highest doses they had for it. And I don't know what kid in third grade isn't hyper, but she said I was out of control. So they threw me on that, and that just everything went downhill after that. How did Ritalin make you feel? First, it made me feel like crap. I mean, I couldn't eat. I'd stay up. I, I couldn't sleep. Emotional. I remember. I remember times when I was so young. I'd come home and I just I'd start crying. I don't even know why. Mom would say one thing to me, cross, and I just go in my room and I just start crying. And that was like uh, like third, fourth, fifth grade. <clears throat> what was your view, if you know, that your father had of you taking that medication? He hated it. Why did he hate it? I don't necessarily. He didn't want me on it. He didn't think I had a problem. Um, my mom wanted me on it. My dad didn't. And I come to find out, my mom kept it in the back of the cabinet for a reason. Why? What was that reason? If he would ever find it, he'd take it and he'd dump it out. You know, he didn't want me on the stuff. He'd dump it out. How and do you know that? Because he's actually done it in front of me. Like he'd actually take the bottle and he'd he'd dump it out. And my mom, she'd just go get another bottle, and you know, next thing you know, I'm right back on it. <coughs> and she'd wait for him to leave, and then she'd put me on it, and she'd give it to me before I go to school, because he leaves first, and then my mom would take me to school. So after he left, she'd put, she'd make sure I took it. So mom's always making sure you take it. Right. Dad's always trying to prevent it. Yeah. Correct. Even to the extent of throwing the medication away. Right, and it, it caused a lot of problems because I'd go go days taking it, and I'd go days without taking it, and it it really really made me moody. It just got bad.
When was the first time you remember getting in any kind of trouble of any significance? Right around third grade, fourth, maybe. Remember what it was? Um, I used to get picked on a lot when I was a kid. I remember I came home, I told my mom about it. Of course, she gave me the generic answer, go tell the teacher. Well, I went and told the teacher, and it turns out, you know, get beat up for telling on somebody in school. Well, came back, told my dad. Dad said, well, go kick his ass then. And she's my language, but, and that's how that happened. And next thing you know, he's getting called into school, and next thing you know, I'm suspended for fighting. What about any alcohol or drug abuse in the home, in the family home? Um, dad, my dad had a drinking problem when I was younger. And I actually remember me and my sister actually coming and sitting on his lap in the kitchen one day and telling him we wanted our dad back. And he quit. How old were you? I, I don't know, maybe 11, 12. And he quit cold turkey right then. He just quit. Okay. What about your mom? Well, I know she used to drink. She'd drink occasionally. But when I got when I got sent to my program to boot camp, and then which was six months, and I did a rehab program, which was another six months. When I got out, it was like the flip was you know the script was completely flipped. What do you I mean by that? Huh? In English, what do you mean by that? tank explosion? We have brand new details on this huge undertaking. Western News first at four starts right. Yarn Valley Lutheran High School. I did maybe a year, two in there, not even a year. And I got expelled from there. And I went to regular high school. I did that for a little bit. Actually, I failed the ninth grade twice. And I got locked up. I went to the boot camp and I buckled down. What was that for? I went to the boot camp because I got evaluated. And apparently, when I was going to court, the psychologist that evaluated me wanted me to go and get some kind of help. Well, my mom, well, the, the courts were going to decide and let me go live with my dad. And my mom just was not having it. So she, my mom told them that I was out of control and that I needed to be placed somewhere else. And they ended up giving me six months boot camp. I've, I've never had behavioral problems before. And she just, she didn't want me going with my dad so bad that she just told him to just lock me up. And I ended up doing six months in boot camp. And, and finally, after six months in it, you know, never making it out of level one because it only takes a week to get out of level one. And after six months of not getting out of level one, you know, realize it's not a There's different levels in boot camp. How many levels was there in your boot There's camp? There's four. Okay. And if, after the first couple of weeks, you get out of level one. You get out of level one. But you didn't get out of level one. Never made it out of level one. You stayed there for six months and never got out of level right. one. Now, why was that? Authority issues, problems, you know, fighting with other people that were there, other kids. I, I, I didn't conform, is pretty much what they told me. You went to the doctors at other times, right? Right. What type of medications in your life have you legally been on? Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta, Stratera, Vocalin. Those are all for ADHD. Uh, Lexapro, Trazodone, Seroquel. I'm pretty sure that's it. All those were with the doctor's prescription, right? Yes, sir. Were you on any medication at the time of this incident? Was not. Were you on any drugs at the time of this incident? I was. Uh, what drugs? Smoking pot and I was drinking heavily. All right. You heard the testimony from your father. I did. Did you sit in the car that night or what? I did sit in the car that night. Had you been drinking? Heavily. What had you been drinking? Uh, Bud Light. So it wasn't like vodka or something that didn't smell, right? How much did you have to consume? Uh, that day, I drank a whole, pretty sure a whole 18-pack. Oh, did you use any breath spray or anything before you went in there? No. Did he bring you three cigarettes? When I got out of the vehicle, I actually asked him for a couple of cigarettes because I ended up smoking all mine. And he did end up giving me some cigarettes, yeah. It appears that you were in transition to the Ely home. In other words, you were moving your stuff in gradually. 
Is that is that pretty accurate? Yeah. Why did you move out of your father's home? Eighteen, like me drinking. I can't drink at grandma's house. You know, grandma's not gonna have it. Can't smoke pot at grandma's house. Grandma would flip. <coughs> I moved out so I could do my own thing. Moved out, moved into Charlie's house, which turns out was the worst decision of my life. You know, moved in there and just it was it was a free for all for a while there. Living on my own for two weeks. I want to see if we can get the flavor of the moment there for the life at the Ely House. Um, who was the head person over there? Kept the place together, I guess. No one. There, 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 there was no keeping it together. I mean, literally, there, there, there was no order. What would happen in a typical day? Everybody's sitting around doing nothing. I mean, I'd leave every once in a while to go do some tattoos and make a little bit of money. Kyle would go to work at McDonald's. But other than that, there, nobody did anything. What about drug use and stuff like that? Oh, there was a lot of drug use. I, bath salt, methamphetamines, um, pot, drinking, there's pills. I probably feel other things that I didn't see that probably were going on. Is that pretty much an ongoing thing over there? Oh, yeah. Everybody participate in that? To the extent of, of the marijuana and the drinking, yeah, but the, the harder stuff, it, that, that was pretty much just Kyle and Soto. You had friends growing up, I assume. I, yeah, I had a few. But not very many. No, I wasn't really. It's not that I wasn't a sociable person. I, you know, put me in a group of people and I make friends quick. It's just I never. When I was growing up, I didn't have opportunities to go to friends' houses or stuff like that. I, I was I was pretty much kept cooped up in the house my entire childhood. I, I don't I don't think I left my street until I was like the age of like 12. So you didn't like go and play with the neighbors or anything like that. I did, but it wasn't wasn't as often as I'd like. You know, I'd, every once in a while. Now eventually, you came under the orbit of these um, so-called friends mm -hmm. that obviously had a proclivity to do drugs. Illegal drugs, street drugs. Right. When was the first time you fell into somebody's orbit like that, or it became a friend? Well, who was the first person? Soto, actually. When I first when I first came down, I was down here about maybe three, four weeks, maybe. Started hanging out with him, and he got me to smoke pot, and it just kind of led up to everything else. But you'd used drugs before that, obviously. Right, yeah. And I kind of, I should have seen it coming when it happened, too. It just, I fell right back into the same stuff I had gotten out of in Michigan. How'd you meet Soto? Neighborhood friends, um, uh, kids in the neighborhood. That's how, I, that's how I met him. He lives, like, literally three, four blocks away. What'd your dad think of Soto? He didn't like him. He, he couldn't stand him. In fact, he told me numerous times, stop hanging out with him. Said he was dangerous, right? Yeah, said so he was going to get me in a lot of trouble one day. That his words exactly. Do well, you think he succeeded? Yeah. You we know. should listen to him, don't you? I really do. Your work history, you just do tattooing, right? I worked at Publix for a little bit. Um, they got this policy if you miss four days within the first six months of your probation period when you first start. And I had pneumonia and even with even with a doctor's note I still I got they had to let me go. They told me a couple more years I could reapply and they, they would have no problem hiring me back. But for that time period because of protocol I couldn't. But right after that, because I love drawing so much I just I got into tattooing. Actually because of Amber and Kyle's dad who tattoos. That's how I got into it and it's just something I picked up and I ran with. Well, there was a point in time when you used to be the term, you know, the term they call a cutter. Yeah, yeah. About, I don't know, about 14, 15 years old. And ha describe how that works. Just hit like a patch of depression, and I'd 
really no way to take it out and just simplest way is take it on yourself because it harms nobody else and no one really cares and it just it's a release you know it's like I wouldn't say a rush like a lot of people say but it it is a release of, of stress and it really is you stopped cutting about the time you started tattooing right right yeah well I actually hadn't cut for a while um I got out of I got out of rehab and everything, and I got out. I was doing good. I was clean. I was sober. And my head screwed on straight. So I, during that period, I wasn't. But came down here, and I got it. Sorry, I got back into that, you know, the drugs and everything. And like I said, everything just picked up right where I left off. Um, of course, you've always been a very good drawer. How did you pick that up anyway? Just had a talent for it, or what? I, yeah, I guess. I mean, my mom's a graphic designer, and you know, she always talks about that's how I got it, but. I don't know. I just is something I was always, you know, pick up a pen, pencil, and just get to drawing. It's just something I'm, I'm, you know, I really like doing. Where do you think the wheel ran off here? It's obviously it did. I moved back to that house. I mean, I'm not saying that if I would have moved back to my house that my life would have been perfect. Cause I was definitely going downhill, but that's where it really, when I moved back in there, drinking got really bad and just I wouldn't have been here if I wasn't there. So your drinking accelerated? How much were you drinking? Until I passed out. It wasn't a limit. Until I threw up, until I passed out, I had a real problem. As a matter of fact, just about all of the money that you earned yeah. tattooing went to alcohol, isn't that correct? Yeah. And occasionally some marijuana. Yeah, that's actually really accurate. Every time I got money, I, I literally went out and got liquor. I was getting alcohol every other day. In 2011, it appears well, from the way the prosecutor describes it, that you were, there was a period of time when you were basically homeless, wasn't there? I mean, yes, but then again, I always had a place to go. I could always go to my grandma's house. There, that, that, that was always an option. You know, grandma, if you don't care what happened, you can come to the house, stay, get something to eat, take a shower, go do whatever you want. But I'm trying to be on my own and everything, and so I, I pretty much crashed everywhere until I finally ended up at Charlie's. I know it's easy looking back in it retrospectively. Um, <laughs> hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Ain't it. But I mean, didn't you get some signals that something wasn't working out right? With myself? Yeah. Or, talking about with the group of people? With the group of people, with yourself? I mean, it's kind of like having a horse with some side liners on. Just I really wasn't paying attention. I mean, yeah. Looking back at it now, you know, I, I can definitely see where a lot of it went wrong. And I can see where it really started snowballing downhill. But I was so caught up in my own stuff that it just, I don't know, I ignored it. Was there ever any time in your life where there was a recommendation, where there was debate over a recommendation to put you in an, an institution? Right. Um, uh, a I mental went, institution. When I went to court. Well, where was that? Hmm? Where, Michigan. I went to... Um, uh, court in Michigan juvenile justice system I had been ordered by DCF to see psychologists seen them and when I went to court they were recommending me go to get some kind of I think it was inpatient they wanted me to go get some kind of inpatient and they were going to release me to my dad afterwards or sometime before then and my mom didn't want that so she had me locked up but when I went to court at that time that was they recommended that I go in point of fact, they found you, uh, or they, your diagnosis basically was, they considered you a danger to yourself and possibly to other people at that time, didn't they? They did. Yeah. And so they sent you that the boot camp program? Yeah, they sent me, yeah, instead they just sent me to a boot camp. They not straighten me out. What do you do in boot camp? <sighs> a lot of push-ups. Anything else? Uh, well, I mean, you PT every every day. You run. Obstacle courses you do. You know, it 
it's really just to try to break you and build you back up, but they can't break you. There's no, it's not going to help you, and that's why I never made it out of level one. You know. Well, it's followed by rehab, right? Right. Well, because because they realized boot camp isn't working, it's not going to do anything for me. I've been here for six months. Well, they realized you know, I was level one. Right. They realized that. Well, who was they? Um, my caseworker. I think his name was Sean Walsh. Nice guy. He realized that this wasn't working, and there was on the same compound. There's a place called W Care I, and it's an intensive rehab, and it's actually I think it ranks somewhere top on the whole eastern side of the country, like one of the best rehab facilities statistically. I went there and got some help because they went through my record and they realized I had a drug problem. So I went there to get help, and I actually got a little bit of help while I was there actually took the initiative and, and tried. When you were younger, I mean, what, what, were, what were your dreams? I mean, what did you want to make of yourself? I had a lot of dreams. Actually, I'm a, cause I, I love fish and I love nature. I've always been an animal person. I, just, I always loved that. I've always wanted to go into, in Michigan, we don't have for a wildlife commission. We have the DNR. I've always wanted to go into something like that or a park range or just something outdoors, something hands-on. I've always, I've always had, always had dreams to do that. But well, I imagine it's pretty difficult to look at your sister on the television, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And your dad, and over all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know what this is all about. Those people back there behind me, they they want to kill you. Yeah, I know. What do you feel about what, what do you feel about what's what's happened? I mean, came at 18 years old. Never had a house. Never had a car. Never been married. Never had kids. They're about to take something from me that I've never even had. Yeah, but what about what their claim, what the jury said you took? How do you feel about that? I wish they could have been there that night. I really do. Your parents? Well, so do I. No further questions. Cross-examination? No questions, Ron. You may step down. That's our last question. <laughs> Members of the jury, we're going to take a recess for the weekend. I'm going to remind you once again and instruct you once again that it is your duty to keep an open mind as to what recommendation this jury shall make to the court after hearing the additional, ma additional matters in this penalty phase. Therefore, please continue to avoid reading any newspaper coverage of this case, watching any related television news, or listening to any news on the radio that may pertain to this case. Also, please do not conduct any inv investigation on your own over the Internet. Please do not discuss this case with your spouses, parents, other family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, or any other person. We will reconvene at 10 minutes before 9 on Monday morning in the same manner as we have been convening for each session during the course of this week. What I'm going to ask you to do is take those notepads with you so that the... ...our chance, but the inland areas remain dry. We'll be in the mid-70s.